sorry to ask the ridiculous question, but who is the greatest mathematician of all time? <laughs> who are the possible candidates? Euler, Gauss, Newton, Ramanujan, Hilbert. We mentioned uh, Gödel, Turing. If you throw him into the bucket, so this is, I think, an incredibly difficult question to answer. I mean, I, personally, I don't really think this way about sort of ranking the mathematicians by greatness. Um, so you don't have like, you know, some people have like a Taylor Swift poster in their dorm room. <laughs> you don't have it. <laughs> I mean, if you forced me to pick someone, it would probably be Archimedes because Archimedes. he is such incredible achievements in such an early era, which totally transcended the work of the other people in his era. So, But I also have the view that I want to learn mathematics and gain mathematical insight from whoever can provide it and wherever I can find it. And and this isn't always just coming from the greats. And sometimes the greats are doing things that are just first and not, you know, somebody else could have easily been first. And so there's a kind of luck aspect to it when you go back and look at, you know, the achievements. And because of this progress issue in mathematics that we talked about earlier, namely, we really do understand things much better now than they used to. And when you look back at the achievement that had been made, then maybe you can imagine, you know, thinking, well, you know, somebody else could have could have had that insight also. Um, and and maybe they would have it's already a known phenomenon that disparate mathematicians end up proving essentially similar results at approximately the same time. But okay, the person who did it first is getting the credit and so on. What do you make of that? Because I see that sometimes when mathematicians, this also applies in physics and science, where completely separately discoveries are made, right. maybe yeah. at a very similar time. What does that mean? It's relatively common. I mean, I think it's like certain ideas are in the air and being thought about but not fully articulated. And so this is the nature of growth in knowledge. Do you understand where ideas come from? Not really. <laughs> I mean, what, what's your own process when you're thinking through a problem? Yeah, that's another difficult question. I suppose it has to do with, I mean, my mathematical style, my style as a mathematician is that I don't really like difficult mathematics. <laughs> what I love is simple, clear, easy to understand arguments that prove a surprising result. That's my favorite situation. And actually, so the question of whether it's a new result or not is somehow less important to me. And, and so that has to do with this question of the greats and so on, whoever does it first. Because I think, for example, if you prove a new result with a with a, a bad argument or complicated argument, that's great because you prove something new, but I still want to see the beautiful, simple, because that's what I can understand. Also, I mean, I'm kind of naturally skeptical about any complicated argument because it might be wrong. And mm -hmm. if I can't really understand it fully, like every single step all at once in my head, then I'm just worried maybe it's wrong. And so there's different styles. Sometimes mathematicians get involved with these enormous research projects that involve huge numbers of working parts mm -hmm. and different technology coming together. I mean, mathematical technology, not physical technology. And sometimes it actually involves now more and more something like the lean programming language where some parts are right. automated. So you have these Yeah, I see. Well, that's another issue because maybe those things are, you know, less subject to skepticism when it's validated sure. by lean. But I'm thinking about the case where the arguments are just extremely complicated. And so I sort of worry whether it's right or not. Whereas, you know, I like the simple thing. And so so I tend to have often worked on things that are a little bit off the beaten path from what other people are working on from so that point of view. Your curiosity draws you towards simplicity. Yeah, I want to work on the things that I can understand and that are simple. And, uh, and luckily, I've found that I've been able to make contributions that other people seem to like, you know, in this way, in this style. And so I've been kind of fortunate from that point of view. I mean, my process always, though, and um, I've recommended this always to my students, uh, is just a kind of playful curiosity. So whenever I have, whenever there's an idea or a topic, 
uh, then I just play around with it and change little things or understand a basic case and then make it more complicated or press things a little bit on this side or apply the idea to my favorite example uh, you know that's relevant or and see what happens or you just play around with ideas and this often leads to insights that then lead to more methods or more you know then pretty soon you're making progress on the problem and so this is basically my method is I just you know fool around with the ideas until I can see a path through uh, towards something interesting mm -hmm. and then prove that. Um, and that's worked extremely well for me, so I'm pretty pleased with that method. You do like thought experiments where you anthropomorphize, like you mentioned? Yeah, yeah, so this is a basic tool. I mean, I use this all the time. You know, you imagine a set theoretic model, a model of ZFC as like a place where you're living and you might travel to distant lands by forcing, and this is a kind of metaphor for what's going on. Of course, you know, the actual arguments aren't anything like that because there's not land and you're not traveling and you're not... But you allow your mind to visualize that kind of thing. Yeah, like an and it helps world. you to understand, particularly when there's parts of the argument that are in tension with one another, then you can imagine that mm -hmm. people are fighting or something. And those kind of metaphors, you know, or you imagine it in terms of a game theoretic, you know, two players trying to win. So that's kind of tension. And and those kind of metaphorical ways of understanding a mathematical problem often are extremely helpful in realizing, aha, the enemy is going to pick this thing to be like that because, you know, it makes it more continuous or whatever. And then we should do this other thing in order to... So it, it makes you realize mathematical strategies for finding the answer and proving the theorem that you want to prove because of the, the ideas that come out of that anthropomorphization. What do you think of uh, somebody like Andrew Wiles, who spent seven years grinding at one of the hardest problems in the history of mathematics, and maybe contrasting that a little bit with somebody who's also brilliant, Terence Tao, who basically says if, if he hits a wall, he just switches to a different problem, and maybe he <laughs> comes back, and so on. So it's less of a focused grind for many years without any uh, guarantee that you'll get there, which is what Andrew Wiles went through, right. maybe Gregory Perlman did the same. I mean, Wiles proved an amazing theorem. The Fermat's last theorem result is incredible. Um, this is a totally different style than my own practice, though, of working in isolation. I mean, for me, mathematics is often a kind of social activity. I have, mm. I counted, I mean, it's pushing towards 100 collaborators, co-authors on various papers and so on. And you know, anybody has an idea they want to talk about with me, if I'm interested in it, then I'm going to want to collaborate with them and we might solve the problem and have a joint paper or whatever. You want to have a joint paper? Yeah, exactly. Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> so my approach to like making mathematical progress tends to involve working with other people quite a lot rather than just working on mm -hmm. my own. And I enjoy that aspect very much. So I personally, I couldn't ever do what Wiles did. Maybe I'm missing out. Maybe if I locked myself, you know, in the bedroom and just worked on whatever, then I would solve it. But I, I tend to think that, no, actually, like being on Math Overflow so much, and I've gotten so many ideas, so many papers have grown out of the Math Overflow conversations and back and forth. Someone posts an an you know, someone posts a question and I post an answer on part of it, and then someone else has an idea and it turns into a full solution, and then we have a three-way paper coming out of that. That's happened many times. And so for me, it's I enjoy this kind of social aspect to it. And it's not just the social part, rather that's the nature of mathematical investigation as I see it, is putting forth mathematical ideas to other people and they respond to it in a way that helps me learn, helps them learn. And I think that's a very productive way of undertaking mathematics. I think it's uh, when you work solo on mathematics, from my outsider perspective, it seems terrifyingly lonely. It, because you're, especially if you do stick to a single problem, especially if that problem has broken many brilliant mathematicians in the past, that you're really putting all your chips in and just the torment, right. the roller coaster of day to day. Because I imagine you have these moments of hopeful break, many breakthroughs, and then you have to deal 
with the occasional realization that no, it was not a breakthrough and that disappointment. Right. And then you have to go like a weekly, maybe daily disappointment where you hit a wall and you have no other person to brainstorm with. You have no other um, avenue to pursue. And it's, I, I don't know. The, the mental fortitude it takes to go through that. But every, every everybody's different. Some people are recluse and just really uh, find solace in that lone grind. Uh, I have to ask about uh, Grisha Grigori Perlman. What do you think of him famously declining the Fields Medal and the Millennial Prize? So he stated, I'm not interested in money or fame. The prize is completely irrelevant to me. If the proof is correct, then no other recognition is needed. What do you think of him turning down the prize? I guess what I think is that mathematics is full of a lot of different kinds of people. And my attitude is that hey, it doesn't matter. Maybe they have a good math idea, and so I want to talk to them and interact with them. And so I think the Perelman case, you know, is a, is maybe an instance where, the you know, he's such a brilliant mind, and he solved this extremely famous and difficult problem, and that is a huge achievement. Um, but he also had these views about, you know, prizes, and somehow I don't really fully understand why he would turn it down. I, I do think uh, I have a similar thing, just observing uh, Olympic athletes that are, in many cases, don't get paid very much, and they nevertheless dedicate their entire lives for the right. pursuit of the gold right. medal. I think his case is a reminder that some of the greatest mathematicians, some of the greatest scientists and human beings do the thing they do, take on these problems, for the love of it, not for the prizes or the money or any right. of that. Now, as you're saying, if the money comes, you could use it for stuff. If the prizes come and the fame and so on, that might be useful. But the reason fundamentally the grades do it is because of the art itself. Sure, I totally agree with that. I mean, I share the view that's, you know, that's why I'm a mathematician. Uh, is because I find the questions so compelling, and I've spent my whole life thinking about these problems. And, um, b you know, but like, if I won an award, <laughs> yeah, it's great. <laughs> it's great. I mean, I'm I'm pretty sure you don't contribute to math overflow for the for the wealth and the, <laughs> and the and the power <laughs> that right. you gain. That's I mean, right. it's yeah, genuine genuine curiosity. Well, you asked who the greatest mathematician is, and. Um, and uh, and of course, if we want to be truly objective about it, we would need a kind of objective criteria about criteria, how yeah. to evaluate the relative, you know, strength in the reputation of various mathematicians. And so, of course, we should use math overflow score because yeah. you know. <laughs> that you're definitively. I mean, nobody <laughs> objectively the greatest mathematician yes, of all time. That's right. Um, I've also argued that tenure and promotion decisions should be based, based on um, math yeah. overflow. So my daughter introduced me to uh, her boyfriend mm -hmm. and told me that she had a boyfriend. Mm -hmm. And I uh, asked him, I what wanted is math to know, overflow? <laughs> first of all, what is his chess rating? And secondly, what is his math overflow score? <laughs> oh, man. Well, that's the only way to judge a person, I think. That's, I think, objectively correct. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>